is organized to, to address a number of uh, issues we all are facing wherever we live in the world. So we will be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on food security in low and middle income countries, as well as the risk posed by the COVID-19 on nutrition status of infant children and women, and the scale and extent of disruption to the food supply chain caused by the pandemic and additional nutrition challenges related to the COVID-19. Well, we have two experts, Professor William Riley and Mahar Joel, who are the nutritionists. They, they are in a very good, they will give us a very good insight into these topics. However, I would briefly like to highlight some key points, how this pandemic have already impacted and still impacting our ways of life, particularly in the context of food security and nutrition. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our life in all aspects. And we can see that even now we need to do a number of activities online and this technology struggle we had uh, over the last one hour is also one of the, the best example I can present you now. So let's let's see how this pandemic is seen to be impacting the, the food security and nutrition. I'll refer back to a document uh, by the United Nations published in June 2020. The, 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 the policy brief given by the United Nations states that COVID-19 pandemic is a health and human crisis threatening the food security and nutrition of millions of people around the world. In particular, the lower and middle income countries are expected to have a negative impacts on their health, education, economies, food and social protection systems. So these negative impacts will put the vulnerable children, families in these countries in even more risk of falling into the intergenerational cycle of malnutrition, ill health and poverty. So how this pandemic is having an impact on our global food system. According to World Food Program, global acute food insecurity will be doubled by the end of 2020. Before the pandemic, almost 130 million people face starvation on a daily basis, and it is expected to increase to 260 million by the end of 2020. So how this pandemic outbreaks are affecting global food supplies in, in several ways by slowing down the harvest in some parts of the world. There's unavailability of the, the, the casual staff workers or workers. And I give you the example that in, in, in Australia, now we are having a severe shortage of uh, mangoes pickers. So it's, it's a mango season now. And now the, the government is, is taking extraordinary uh, uh, actions how to, to resolve the, the problems the farmers are facing. Plus, there's a constraint to transport our food to the markets, meat processing plants and other food markets are closed. Farmers are burning their perishable produce because it cannot reach to the, 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 the markets are the, due to falling demand of the consumers from the consumer as well as rising food costs are also making access to the food difficult for many people. So what's our challenge? How we can mitigate? The way we can address this issue is to reshape our overall food safety system. So they support healthy diets to all and do more to make food production and consumption aligned to the sustainable development. So how does this pandemic relate to the nutrition issues? According to the Asia United Nations Network on Nutrition, they have raised a concern around the impacts of COVID-19 on the nutrition status of those most affected, particularly the poor and vulnerable. And in their joint statement, they have identified six domains of healthy diets, maternal, infant, young children nutrition, management of wasting, micronutrient and supplementation, school feeding and nutrition, and nutrition surveillance. They're 
how to address these issues to, to minimize the impact of low quality nutrition on these populations. Well, we are still in the middle of this pandemic and this lot is known and lot is unknown. We don't know how long this pandemic is going to be. Therefore, the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on food, health, and social protection system are yet to be realized. However, the, the pandemic is expected to increase the risk of all forms of malnutrition. And this is what our experts are going to give us more thought into it. And with this one, I would like to thank uh, Asia Pacific Institute and the University of Central Punjab for organizing this event. At the end of my talk, I would like to share uh, our upcoming activity in de December. That's uh, our seventh Asia Pacific Probiotic Workshop that will be jointly organized by the Asia Pacific Institute of Food Professionals and the Research Institute of Food Science and Technology in Mashhad, Iran, with the help or uh, with the, mm, the collaboration of our other partner throughout Asia Pacific. So we, there's email address where you can seek more information and registration. With this one, I would like to thank all of the attendees of this webinar. I hope that you will find the information presented by our expert speakers useful and valuable. Thank you. Back to Sadia. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azaf, and uh, this was a valuable thing to, uh, that you shared with us. Uh, but hopefully, uh, we were uh, today in today's uh, we can we can figure out the the problems which we are facing uh, being a lower middle income country. And now for the more insight, I will hand it over to Dr. William Riley. He can uh, uh, share the, his case study with us, and that will be a very valuable for all of the people and all the attendees who are here. So over to Dr. William. Oh, thank you. Well, good afternoon from Metro Manila, uh, a very large city. I've been trapped here since January, although this is my home for the last five years. Um, but I've been trapped here in the sense that I've not been able to travel back to uh, my home country of Canada, where I usually visit quite often to see my four children and seven soon to be eight grandchildren. So I miss them all very much. But here in the Philippines, I can spend my time trying to help the many, many children here and young mothers and fathers who are trying to work their way through this pandemic and helping the many nutritional challenges that they face here in the Philippines. So I wanna share with you some of my thoughts on what those challenges are today. Let me share my screen here with you. Okay, here we are. You know, the Philippines has a lot in common with other countries in South Asia like Pakistan. Um, it's somewhat unique um, in a sense that it has malnutrition problems that uh, at both ends of the spectrum. They have malnutrition like some first world countries that here in, here in Manila, they suffer from overnutrition. But really the biggest problem they suffer from is the malnutrition at the other end of the spectrum. And that is that they have one of the highest levels of stunting and wasting in the world. And this pandemic has only exacerbated those problems. You know, COVID-19, the pandemic is a, really a crisis on top of a crisis. And so what, what the pandemic has done is it's adversely affected, well, you know, my age group, I'm in the over 65 age group, the grandfathers of the world, and it's, it's put a burden on us, but it's also put a burden on the young and the mothers especially who have to take care of the young because they are always at risk of malnutrition and the nutritional problems that face them and the economic problems that have come with that. 
So when you look at COVID-19, the entire world has been burdened with these economic problems and the access that people now don't really have to safe, nutritious, nutritious food and the health problems that have come with that. So, you know, on top of the, the risk and the challenges to the health that people get from the virus, malnutrition is on top of that. Undernutrition only exacerbates it. So you get the obesity and then any diet related non-communicable diseases that are associated with it, especially in some of these, you know, low to medium um, income countries like the Philippines, they're in Southeast Asia. To date, um, Philippines has been the second most severely um, hit countries in Southeast Asia next to Indonesia, as far as the pandemic has been. You know, overall, uh, uh, on a world basis, the GDP probably is going to fall, as you can see here, by six to ten percent around the world uh, on a global basis. That's going to push people further into poverty and malnutrition in the most at-risk countries. It's disrupted the livelihood of, you know, over one to 1.5 billion people around the world. And you don't see it as is maybe as obvious as, as uh, in the developed countries, but there's an under, underground economy. We, we call it the informal economy. And that can be up to half the world's workforce. It's very apparent in co countries like the Philippines, where that labor force that, that kind of operates uh, under the radar, if you will. And a lot of that is women and youth. Um, and, and that's really been disrupted. And a lot of that is the production, the transportation, storage, the food economy. You know, you don't maybe see it in the normal stores, but that's been very much disrupted because people can't move. That's been, it's been, um, restricted by governments, it's been restricted by policies. And so they've been unable to move the food back and forth. Health systems have been disrupted. Hospitals have been overburdened. People don't have access to the hospitals. And in some cases, like here in the Philippines, people don't have the money to go to the hospital and to, to pay for the, the health problems that they've had. There's decreased access to food as well too. Increased maternal deaths, child mortality, which is always a problem here in the Philippines. You look at some of the figures here, estimates, an additional 10,000 children worldwide may die from malnutrition. Malnutrition is already a problem here in the Philippines and it's only going to be expanded now. It's estimated by the end of 2020, the number of wasted children meaning waste in, in, in terms of the loss of muscle mass around the world could increase by up to 7 million children. Another estimate, each percentage point drop in the global GDP could be 700,000 more stunted children. What do we mean by stunted? You know, every, every child has a certain genetic potential to grow in height. Stunting means that they don't reach that potential. The Philippines is one of those countries. Others are found in South Asia, also in Africa, where children are stunted. They don't reach that. And the primary reason is because they don't have the proper nutrition, especially in the first two years of growth when they don't eat, they don't have a sufficient nutrition, uh, especially the long bones don't grow. And if they don't, they don't have that uh, nutrition support, then the bones seal and they never reach that proper uh, length. In the Philippines, actually, if you, I saw recent uh, statistics on this, the uh, shortest countries in the world maybe a trivia question for you. 
the shortest country in the world, height-wise, and this combines males and females, is Indonesia. Philippines is number three at 1.61 meters in height. Number two is Bolivia in South America. So the Philippines is very much stunted in growth overall. Some of that is genetic, of course, but much of it has to do with malnutrition. Uh, Dr. Malik also mentioned this, acute hunger uh, will perhaps double by the end of 2020. So let's focus on the Philippines again here. And you can see that one third of all children in the Philippines, 11 million children, and that's over 10% of the total population of the Philippines are stunted. One third of all children. That's an amazing number, isn't it? What, that, what does that do? It increases mortality. It increases the risk of infection, delayed development, also cognitive ability as well too. Children don't learn as well when they're malnourished. The mortality rate of children under five, one, 34 out of a thousand of those um, will die here in the Philippines. It's a very high child mortality rate here. 45% of these child deaths are attributed to some form of malnutrition. The Philippines is one of the highest rates of vitamin A deficiency in the world. That leads to something called night blindness um, in both children and in adults here. Anemia is endemic in the Philippines as well too. You can see from this picture, the child, very thin legs. Um, she's quite small. You see that in uh, imperial measurement, but in feet. But I'll show you some other pictures here as well too that will point that out. Stunting again, one third of children less than five years of age are stunted. That number hasn't changed very much. Um, there are government programs to address this. They've been marginally successful, but not good enough. Prenatal factors involved in this, low birth weight. I'd have to add as well too that the teenage pregnancy rate is very high here in the Philippines. And that doesn't help either because those teenage girls tend to be malnourished as well too. So it's internal malnutrition, including iron deficiency anemia, that contributes to the stunting also. Delayed initiation of breastfeeding, despite the fact that hospitals are required to initiate breastfeeding, but many of those young mothers don't actually give birth in the hospitals. They give birth out in the provinces, they give birth with maybe a nurse or a wet nurse. There are low rates of exclusive breastfeeding. In other words, they will breastfeed for a short while and then give that up. And then often a, a formula is given with um, water that is not, um, not safe to, to deliver. Um, and then there's a low diversity of food. You would think that here in the Philippines, there's a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. In some places, yes, and others, no. But actually, the Philippines, over 7,000 islands, but these are volcanic islands, and it's not the best of soils to, to grow uh, fruits and vegetables on. Um, and much of the, the islands are mountainous. And so once you get beyond the, the shorelines, uh, it's not really very good agricultural land. So they don't really have a large variety of foods. Um, to sustain themselves on. Here's a map of the Philippines. You know, here's the large island of Luzon in the north. Uh, I live here in Metro Manila. Uh, most of the population is here in the north, down here in the south, in the next largest island, Mindanao, uh, and here in the center of the Visayan Islands. And you can see the darkest red is the highest percentage of stunted children. And the very dark regions, half the children in these dark regions here are stunted in growth. It's quite amazing really to see that. And the pictures don't lie, do they? This would be a, a median level. You see some of the children maybe above that, but many of the children here below that level. Again, one in three. Malnutrition undermines human capital 
economic productivity. It limits progress in meeting the World Health Assembly's Millennium Development Goals. You need to invest in nutrition in the Philippines to further economic gain. I'd be amiss if I didn't tell you that, yes, there's programs for this, money is put into it, but corruption is endemic in the Philippines. You know, money is often devoted to it, but money doesn't get to where it should be going. It's, it's, it's diverted elsewhere. You know, the best laid plans and the money goes amiss. We, we all know that. Um, to reduce child mortality, the proper um, nutrients need to be delivered to them. You know, do mothers all get the uh, prenatal vitamins and minerals that, that need to be delivered to them? Often not, you know. Um, the seventh National Nutrition Survey that was done in 2013, they should be done more often, but those, those uh, funds that should be devoted to them uh, haven't been put in place. So we, we don't know what the latest uh, nutrition surveys would uh, reveal to us. But the last one, 12 to 14 percent of children under the age, uh, under a year of age, have already been stunted. That's amazing. By one year old, 12 to 14 percent of children are already stunted in growth. And then that goes to 25 percent by one year of age. So even before two years of age, already a quarter of the children are stunted in their growth. That tells you full well that sufficient nutrition isn't getting to them. You know, the, the children here live near the ocean, right? And you would think, well, at least they're getting sufficient iodine. Actually, no. Remember, I mentioned that, that many of them uh, live up in the mountains, so they don't actually eat a lot of fish. They don't get down to the seashore often enough. And actually, for that reason, they don't get enough calcium. Very little dairy consumption goes on here in the Philippines, and their source of dairy would be the small bones they get from the fish as well, too. So if they're not getting fish for the iodine or kelp, you know, for iodine as well, too, they're also not getting calcium. And that, that again, leads to the, the uh, bone development problems. Infectious diseases, intestinal parasites. So many of those children, if you think back to the picture you just saw, they're barefoot all the time. They pick up intestinal parasites and leading to diarrhea, loss of fluids, and the wasting problems that you see. Other problems, intrauterine growth restrictions, stunting, wasting, underweight. Look, 21.5% of Filipino children the age of five are underweight. So they're stunted in their growth and they're underweight as well too. The pictures shout out to you. Look at the development on them. The mothers are small, the baby's small, and here in the classroom. I didn't mention as well also, no, we don't for the most part have malaria, but dengue fever takes many lives here and it has severe morbidity as well too. And I should note too, and people don't think it here, but I, I see it all with my eyes. You know, they make the little girls wear skirts to school and yet mosquitoes are rampant and they carry dengue fever with them. On top of this, job displacement. 50% of the workforce has lost their jobs on top of this with a pandemic. Unemployment rate. This has broken records since 2012 when 34% lost their job. We're talking 45 to 50% have lost their jobs now. Of course, highest among, higher among women than men. Women hold down jobs and they're holding down the family at home. And unfortunately, the youngest have lost their jobs, you know, and, and many of those are uh, young families with young children. Hardest hit, hit in the Philippines, many call centers servicing the Western world are located here in the Philippines because they're crowds, many people together, 
they can't be now. And so that's been very hard hit, nearly 30%. Fishing and aquaculture has lost work and that's food, right? And then universities, none of those are back in business now. Professional scientific tech activities are gone. Only recently have the public schools tried to get back in, in place. This is the worst recession since 1991 when the oil supply was crippled and going back 36 years since the Marcos regime fell. The first quarter, the GDP fell around 1%. This second quarter, 17%. So an already challenged economy is now down 17%, you know, in a developing economy at best. Supply chain challenges, well, yes, you know, you've got 7,000 islands, so we always had challenges here in getting food from one place to the other. And now you've, you've sectioned off literally neighborhoods from each other. The government won't let you cross from one, one neighborhood to the other. So production problems, challenges selling harvest, restrictions on movement. And so farmers have had to turn to social media to try to sell, right? You, you can't, you may even have to give away your vegetables instead of letting them rot. To strengthen those linkages, they've turned to um, local uh, supply chains. You can't maybe transport them. So there's local clusters. In Luzon, there's supply chains. In the Visayas, some, and down in Mindanao. So instead of maybe transporting them across the Philippines, they've done them locally. These are local government supply chain clusters. So a little resiliency there. You can see here in the eastern Visayas, the islands down here, um, the locals purchased 32 million US dollars worth of agricultural goods from Lowe's farmers. This is a move food initiative that enabled consumers in Metro Manila to order produce from local farmers by online uh, forms. In the Philippines, you know, banking doesn't always work. <laughs> Works for the big people, but maybe not for the local people. So 75% of the population is not banked. Um, financing in rural businesses is limited by the infrastructure. So because of that, uh, traditional financing is by family. And it's been even more challenged here in, in this situation. So it's informal lending that goes on. It's peer-to-peer -peer lending that has had to um, step in and do this. And the final problem here in the Philippines, and it's quite unique to the Philippines. Um, you may have seen it in your part of the world, but Filipinos leave. If they have any skills, they leave the Philippines because they can't find jobs here. And so overseas Philippine workers send money back to the Philippines. And unfortunately, many of them have lost their, lost their jobs overseas. In fact, this number has come back to the Philippines. What does that mean? They're not sending money back to the Philippines and now they're unemployed back in the Philippines. 50,000 of those were working on the ocean, 75,000 were land-based and they're back home. Overseas Filipinos, this much income has fallen. 840 million US dollars is not coming back to the Philippines. And these little children don't get fed from that money that's come back, compounding the problem. Here's the difference. And these are the sources. These Filipinos worked in Saudi Arabia, Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Germany, United Kingdom, and elsewhere, you know, Hong Kong, et cetera. And here's the differences in the incomes. Look at the differences in the drops here. 30%, 28%, over 30% has fallen just from last year in just that three month initial period. It's dropped even further since then. That's a tremendous decrease in income that's come into the Philippines. 
This is how much it actually amounts to per year. 30 billion US dollars each year or 8% of the entire Philippine economy came from overseas workers. That's almost 5 trillion Pakistan rupees comes to the Philippines normally from overseas workers. It's a, it's a huge amount of income and that's going down and down as this pandemic stretches on. Think of how many children here, how many families depend upon that income for their sustenance and their nutrition. Well, Filipinos are resilient. So when you talk about food chains and supply chains, you know, the government restricted one of their main forms of transportation, the jeepney. Usually people are in here. So what the Filipinos did, they filled it up with food supplies and they moved it about that way. So I'll give the Filipinos credit. They are resilient and they found ways to do things when things were bad. So I have faith in the Filipinos. I will stay here, as, you know, because this is my second home now, and I will assist in any way I can. But I sure hope I can get back and see my grandchildren and especially my youngest daughter's new one coming in February. I thank you very much. And I hope that you in Pakistan will weather the storm as well as we are here. And I turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, doc, thank you, Dr. William. I mean, this was this was a wonderful thing which you have uh, shared with us. And, and, and from this, I can get that all lower middle income countries do have the same problems, uh, you know, in, in, in matter of like, um, like uh, the child death due to the standard growth and due to the, the inavailability of the food, proper food. Even in Pakistan, the rate is like higher than 42 person. Most of the children get died um, right after two or three days after their birth. And due to this lockdown and everything, the supply chain of the food is, is disrupted badly. And whatever case study you have presented um, in the form of like in the Philippines, you know, um, it's it's same like in Pakistan. And we are we are still struggling and still coping with the thing. But there are there are lots of questions about, about many things which we have talked about, but we will take them at the last um, mm -hmm. in, in our discussion session. And thank you very much again for a very enrichment talk. Uh, now I will uh, I will uh, hand it over the thanks with uh, Maha uh, Maha Jawi. Then she is the consultant nutritionist, and she will talk about the particularly about the mother and child health and the importance of, of of the food availability and proper nutrition for the mother and the child. Over to you, Maha. Thank you. Ma, you are mute. You can open up your mic. Can you? Uh... Yeah, we can see the slides and you are okay with that. Let's put it on a slide mode, I guess. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sadia and Dr. William, Dr. Malik Alda, for the wonderful session. And I'm so grateful uh, to University of Central Punjab for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, about the importance of nutrition among the toddlers and children and baby uh, boys and girls and the importance and the protection of the maternal and child health in pandemic COVID-19. Actually, I can't see my slides, so there is a problem over there. 
So starting just from the quick review uh, regarding like everybody knows what is COVID-19 and what is Corona. So starting from just a quick review that COVID-19 basically it is the infectious disease caused by the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, which is a respiratory pathogen. And the symptoms of this uh, COVID-19 uh, are mostly no. Uh, for example, uh, flu and chest infection, lethargy feeling, high grade fever, specifically and particularly shortness of breath and the loss of taste and uh, smell. So my going towards uh, the main topic that is the mother. I think there's an internet problem. Um, Ma, we can uh, hear you and see you. I mean, you can continue. Okay. Uh, going, uh, going towards my main topic, that is the mother and child protection in COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> so if a mother or a, her baby child has suspected or confirmed the COVID-19, so they should follow some basic protective measures which protect them against the virus or the seasonal infections like the cold and flu. Uh, the way that the Dr. William described the importance of uh, breastfeeding. So the main thing is that breastfeeding is very important like being a nutritionist or being a health practitioner. It's my responsibility, it's my duty that I have to educate the people regarding the importance of the breastfeeding. And I want the other people also that they should disseminate the knowledge regarding, especially to educate the mothers regarding the importance of the breastfeeding. So breastfeeding, it is not only uh, healthy for infants, but it is also healthy for the mothers as well. As we know that the breastfeeding, it provides the health benefits for mothers beyond the emotional satisfaction. Mothers who breastfeed, they recover from childbirth very easily and very quickly. And breastfeed releases the hormone that is called the oxytocin. It is also acts to return the uterus to its normal size, to its regular size more quickly. Besides this, oxytocin also reduces the postpartum bleeding. So I described the importance of the breastfeeding uh, for mothers. Now I'm going towards the importance of the breastfeeding uh, for the infants, for the babies. After that, I will uh, explain or I will uh, briefly describe uh, the protective uh, measures which the mother have to take it. So breast milk, it is a full pack of the nutrition and uh, for the baby. And it provides uh, the multiple uh, nutrients, the macronutrients and the macronutrients. And it is a full pack of the proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. If we talk about the vitamins in mother's milk, then the baby can get the thiamine, vitamin B1, vitamin B2, that is riboflavin, vitamin B3, uh, niacin, and the vitamin B5, that is called the pentothenic acid. Besides this, uh, the consumption of the vitamin, breast milk also contains the antibodies that is called immunoglobulins for the baby's fight against the viruses and the bacteria. And it has been observed that the babies who are breastfed exclusively for the first uh, six months along with complementary diet or along with the nutrient dense foods, they are less prone to the infections. They are less prone to the diseases. For example, ear infections, respiratory disorders and food allergies, asthma, and as well as diarrhea as well. <clears throat> Uh, can you hear me? Actually, there is some internet problem, so I had to switch uh, off my video. No, uh, you, you are uh, all okay. You can listen. You can listen. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, start breastfeeding the baby within, uh, within an hour, within one hour when the mother delivers the baby, and continue the breastfeeding the baby until two years of age. Introduce nutrient dense foods or complementary foods uh, such as uh, poached egg, bananas, rice, and uh, 
toast uh, toast along with the breast milk from six months of age. And it's my humble request to all of the people who are listening to me right uh, now, please do not try to add sugar or salt into that complimentary food. Otherwise your child will forget the taste of the natural food and he or she will adapt the, the taste of the salt and sugar, which is not good at all for his or her health. If a mother is confirmed with COVID-19, it is essential for her, it is mandatory for her to wear a medical mask when in touch or when get in contact with her baby. She should wash her hands thoroughly and frequently with soap. She can use sanitizer as well, but it is very important for her to disinfect and sanitize the hard surface, uh, which is of the frequent use or of the regular use. Okay, if now the mother is severely ill or uh, she has some with complications, then she should avoid carrying her baby or continuing to breastfeed directly. She can go for another uh, option. Uh, she can go another approach like express breast milk, but it should be hygienically safe. Uh, sometimes it is not, uh, uh, it is not possible that express uh, breast milk and it cannot be provided, but she can go like uh, she can start uh, breastfeeding after a gap or she can hire some wet nursing. But again, it depends on her personal level preferences, whether she is okay to go for it or not. Okay, now I'm going to briefly describe the basic preventive measures uh, for the mother who is uh, breastfeeding her uh, baby. So as I described earlier that wear a medical mask and wash your hands thoroughly and frequently are the most important things in this pandemic. Secondly, while coughing or sneezing, she should cover her mouth or uh, she should cover her nose with bent elbow. Uh, in, if she has some tissue, she can also use it, but it is very necessary to dispose of that uh, tissue at the same time, but not on the road or uh, any other place, but she should dispose uh, that tissue in the dustbin immediately. Uh, avoid touching eyes, nose and mouth. Wear a mask if a mother or child has respiratory system, such as shortness of breath. Uh, if mother or child has some mild symptoms such as headache, lethargic feeling, or slightly running nose or some allergy in the throat, then they should prefer to stay at home. And if this condition get worse, or if they see that there are some complications, then they should contact to uh, health uh, professionals immediately. But uh, they uh, firstly, initially, uh, they Hello. Uh, yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Please continue. Yes, ma'am, please continue. Okay. Okay, uh, the next point is uh, maintain a distance and it is mandatory for, uh, okay, I'm talking about the maternal and child protection, but it is mandatory for all of the people, especially in this pandemic, that they should maintain a distance at least for about the one meter with any person, or who are coughing or they are sneezing. And last but not least, be informed about the latest developments with COVID-19 and follow the advice given by the healthcare providers. So uh, my next topic is the importance of the nutrition and the nutritional guidelines among people, specifically among the age group, uh, in different age groups, uh, like toddlers, children, girls, and boys with the two years up till 18 years of age. As we all know that the good nutrition, the best nutrition is essential for a strong immune system. 
which protects our system or which protects our body from uh, different seasonal changes and uh, multiple diseases like uh, cold, like flu, and multiple diseases like heart disease, uh, diabetes, respiratory disorders, et cetera, et cetera. But in other case, uh, if your immune system is weak and it is not strong, that it decreases your body's ability to find invaders. And it is more prone to multiple diseases. As I mentioned, the diseases like food allergies and uh, the respiratory disorders, the obesity, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if we talk about the diet or if we talk about the nutrition, I'm so sorry, there's electricity, uh, electricity shut down here and my net got disconnected. So I connected through my hotspot. Okay, uh, I'm extremely sorry, I'm back now. Uh, starting from the different, uh, as I told that the diet is very important to boost your immune system, but one should know that it is full of the balanced diet, which, uh, which uh, included your cereals and uh, fruits and vegetables and proteins, dairy and dairy products. Starting from uh, the fruits, uh, fruits are uh, full, uh, they are full packed with the vitamins, multiple vitamins and minerals. So basically, if we talk about the, uh, here is a winter in Pakistan and uh, the seasonal fruits, citrus fruits are uh, here. So they are full of the vitamin C and vitamin C, it supports the immune system and it stimulates the formation of the antibodies and include more sources of this healthy vitamins by choosing citrus fruits, as I mentioned earlier, such as oranges, grapefruits, blueberries, et cetera, et cetera. But one uh, main thing uh, which I'm going to describe that the servings, the servings are very important for the different age groups. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that one cup per day is a serving for the toddlers for the age of the two years to two, three years and 1.5 cups per day is for children's, that is four years to 13 years. Similarly for the girls, 14 to 18 years and two cups per day uh, serving. And it is for the boys, 14 years to 18 years. One should uh, thing, one thing should be kept in your mind that I'm talking about the cups and the size of the cup is 230 to 250 ml. And it is the exact size which the nutritionists recommend. So the journal instructions are under six, year, under six years of age, children are not allowed to consume fruit juice more than half cup. Uh, fruit juices should be 100% pure without any added sugar. But being a nutritionist, I prefer to eat wholesome fruits as compared uh, to the fruit juices because there is less fiber as compared to the wholesome fruits. Beyond seven years of age, Fruit juice consumption should be lower than 1.5 cups and one cup of fresh fruits is equal to half cup of dry fruits. So I would recommend that the children, they should uh, consume uh, fresh fruits and fresh juices. No doubt dry fruits are also very healthy, but if you are talking about the fruits, then the fruits, uh, they should be uh, uh, in priority basis. Okay, the second uh, food group, which I'm going to discuss the vegetables and uh, vegetables, there are multiple, uh, you can say carrots and uh, radish and uh, green peppers, bell peppers, they are full of antioxidants. They are full of the carotenes and they provide, they give uh, you the essential vitamins and the minerals and also especially the vitamin a, vitamin A, and it is really very important, especially for your eye cell. Again, I am the uh, main 
uh, describe the servings of the different age groups, like one cup per day for toddlers, 1.5 cups per day for children, two cups girls, and uh, 2.5 cups for boys and girls for 14 years to 18 years, and three cups per day for boys, 14 years to 18 years. Uh, one main thing that when uh, we talk about the cooking or uh, when we cook the vegetables, please do not overcook the vegetables because the minerals and the vitamins which are uh, present in the vegetables, they lost their essential uh, importance upon heating. And for the consumption of the dried or the canned vegetables, they should be labeled as without added salt. As I described earlier that if uh, somebody, and especially your children, if they are going uh, for the fruit juices, then it should be natural. It should not be processed or they should be without sugar. And uh, similarly, if I talk about, if I'm talking about the vegetables that uh, if somebody is going to get a canned vegetable, then sh they should uh, see the food label and it should be mentioned that it is uh, without salt. Okay, now uh, I'm going to describe the importance of the proteins in the diet. And uh, the proteins, the main proteins uh, are considered as the macronutrients. And uh, it is very, uh, they perform very important and very uh, vital functions in our human body. Uh, first of all, that proteins plays a role in the body's immune system. They uh, produce the more, uh, they produce more anti and antibodies and secondly uh, they are very helpful in the growth and development and they are very helpful in wound healing and uh, in wound healing of any person uh, eat a variety of the protein foods including the seafood unless or until you are allergic to it uh, you can uh, easily uh, one more thing that proteins, uh, uh, food sources are divided into two main categories, the low biological value proteins and the high biological value proteins. High biological value proteins contain meat and meat organs, and the low biological value proteins contain uh, lentils, uh, beans, and uh, high biological value proteins contains also contains, I forgot to mention eggs. Okay, so three portions of the proteins should be consumed by wagon to toddlers. Fish should be consumed twice in a week. Uh, fish is a very nutritious uh, food. And uh, besides it provides protein, it is the best source of the protein. Uh, fish is also a very good source of the omegas. And omegas are the consum when you consume omegas, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9 fatty acids, it has, they are, it has a good effect on your heart. Uh, when we talk about the importance of uh, heart, then uh, we talk about the three uh, lipoproteins, that is the low density lipoproteins, the high density lipoproteins, and the very low density lipoproteins. So the consumption of the fish. Can you hear me? Because I'm getting error over yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's okay. You can continue. Okay. Uh, okay, nuts are also considered as the proteins and... Okay, now coming towards the dairy and the dairy products, and it is also a, a food group. Three portions per day are required for the toddlers and children for two years up till eight years of age. And uh, the dairy and dairy products include the milk and the cheese, yogurt, and kefir, and the products that are uh, for, produced or the formed from the milk. So basically the main instructions for the toddlers and especially for the mothers, under two years of age, whole milk or yogurt should be consumed. If we uh, give semi-milk or if we give the reduced felt, uh, fat milk under two years of age, then being a nutritionist, it is not, uh, I would suggest that it is not appropriate at all because it's the right time for a child for, her, for his or her growth and development. 
After two years of age, toddlers, children who eat well can be consumed skim milk. Skim milk or one person milk are not allowed to consume under five years of age. Uh, now I would like to talk uh, about the journal instructions. Uh, first of all, give your child whole grains, cereals such as wheat, oats, barley. But now if uh, I am talking about the wheat and if you give your child or if there is any, uh, if you, I'm so sorry, actually there's problem over here. Okay, make sure that your child drinks enough water regularly and water helps uh, in keeping hydration levels to peak, regulating body's optimal temperature, transporting important nutrients, detoxifying body and lubricating integral body joints make it necessity for the life. Ensure that the child to drink eight to 10 cups of water on daily basis. As I mentioned earlier, then uh, your child, uh, he or she sh uh, should try to uh, not consume uh, sweetened uh, beverages or the fruits with the added sugar. So the other sugars, uh, other drinks, for example, unsweetened milk, fruits and vegetables that contain water, for example, cucumber, tomatoes, uh, mushrooms can also be given. Make sure that your child eats less fat. Add unsaturated fats, for example, fish, nuts, olive oil, soy, canola, sunflower, and corn oils rather than saturated fatty acids, for example, butter, uh, palm, and coconut oils, because uh, they are more prone, the consumption of the saturated fatty acids are more prone uh, to uh, heart health, because it raises the level of the low density lipoproteins in the human body. If the low density lipoproteins raises in the human body, then uh, the chances of the atherosclerosis, the thickening and the hardening of the arterial walls decrease the amount of the sodium and the sodium uh, condiments, for example, the soy sauce and salt while preparing the food for the child. Limit the salt quantity to less than five gram, approximately one teaspoon, preferably iodized salt. Avoid giving salty and sugary snacks, soft drinks, juice, con concentrates and syrups, flavored milks, etc. Avoid adding salt in dough while needing to make any cereal products. The last thing which I am going to encourage regarding, uh, especially in this pandemic situation, please uh, prepare your meal, prepare your food uh, at homes and uh, avoid uh, to uh, eat foods from the restaurants because it is uh, not the safest time and it is not the hygienically uh, safe. So home uh, cooked food is hygienically more safe and healthier for growing children than caloric uh, filled food from outside the home. Processed and fast foods are high in calories, salt, fat, and sugar. Taking children to eat out during COVID-19 outbreaks elevates their chance of being exposed to the virus. Thank you so much. So if you have any questions, so if you have any queries, please ask me away. Um, well, thank you, Maha, for, for the very good information and valuable talk. Let's uh, we, I, I do have uh, um, some of the questions uh, regarding the both the presentations, and I would like to start with the, all of them. Obviously, um, uh, regarding if we, we would discuss the scenario uh, within the COVID and right away, so we can judge that um, there are most of the problems which Dr. William has uh, mentioned um, as compared to your age groups and mother age, malnutrition, undernutrition, and even 
very, very important word here is know that like wasted children. So Dr. William, we do have one question about that, that what are basically the wasted children and how the pandemic is currently hitting uh, the age groups of the children and what are their way outs? What we can do with those problems? Uh, is it specific to Philippines or just in, in general? It's, 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 it's in general because you have stud, uh, uh, shared the case study of Philippines, but the problem yeah. is everywhere in all lower middle income countries. Yeah. Well, you, you know, the, the problem is, is not so much that the food is not being produced because it is being produced. It's really a problem of the economics. The people are losing their sources of income. And so the the problem becomes one of the governments needing to either provide the food directly or some source of the income for the people to be able to afford the food because the, the lower income people simply don't have the resources now to access the food. And when you look at the numbers um, of the, you know, the unemployment, um, the, the reality is that these people just, they're the first to lose their jobs. And unless they have locally produced food, then where, where are they going to get it? You know, in, in some cases, if they're in rural locations, you know, they may be producing their own food. But if, they, if they're dependent upon uh, food supplies coming to them, uh, for instance, here in Metro Manila, that was the, the biggest concern in the city where food had to come into the city and the government immediately blocked transportation routes. So the supply chains were cut. And then they, they literally did not have any food coming to them. And without jobs, because you know, they were not allowed to work and then without the resources, without their work, how could they sustain themselves? They were already at risk. And, you know, people in the first world don't understand that when we talk about cheap food, you know, in, in for instance, North America, when, when they, they spend 10% of their income on food, they don't realize that in developing countries, it may cost you 30 to 50% of your income to buy food, right? And so in a pandemic like this, suddenly when you don't have income, you know, <laughs> the first thing that goes is your ability to buy food, right? Because half of your income was going to buy food. So, it, it, you know, people living in urban areas and they lose their job, they can't eat. And so the, it's really befalls the governments, right? And the officials to provide either food or income of some sort to the people, or they're going to starve. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and or, 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 okay, let, 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 if, if, if from your extract from your talk that uh, the, the problem is basically uh, with the, the increase in unemployment and uncertainty uh, around us. And that is basically poking or indirectly giving us uh, the problem of food and nutrition. But, but how we can tackle that But if we have a very limited resources and the people who are already in problem with with respect to the food. So within this situation, how we can help and how we can suggest the things right away. Yeah. Um, well, for one thing, and, and it's happened here in the Philippines, is that the corporations have helped. And we can certainly encourage that because we have connections to corporations. You know, we as nutritionists and food professionals do have contacts to corporations. Um, because we work with them as food professionals. And for instance, San Miguel Corporation, which is the largest uh, food producer here, and several others have come forward and donated food. And that has been a tremendous boost. Um, they, they've donated um, meat products. They've donated in some of the flour mills and rice producers have donated food products as well. So, 
you know, you can go directly to the, the food producers themselves. And then through um, public uh, health professionals, through the nutritionists that work in the public health, they've lobbied to the government uh, to, to open up stores of food, which have, have gone directly to people as well too. So, you know, governments hold on to storage of, of food products as well too, correct? And so those have been released also. And so it's taken a, a lobbying effort within the government also to make those available. But it's, it's been a, a combination, it's multi-sectoral. It has to go through the government, it has to go through the private sector as well too. And the private sector has had to step forward also and realize that you know, they have had to A, make products available too, and do their best to re-employ people and employ them in different circumstances. That is, you know, working at home and in, you know, uh, non-normal uh, situations. So it, it's been both. So uh, chances that we can we can give them a very particular food items which are very much you know uh, concerned with the and have that food and eat at least they can have a good um, availability of nutrients in that so can can we way that we can typically give them that food which is important for them uh, at least for the immunity at this stage um, beside rest of the things things an organization can arrange that sort of food which is very uh, typical and uh, our need of the R for for the mother for the children it's like that we can recommend the things like that right right and in fact that that's like with the University of the Philippines it's been working with you know, our connections in the food and nutrition department with our graduates that work in the, the uh, community nutrition sectors and the public uh, health sectors, you know, in recommending the types of foods that should be distributed in the communities. Because we have those arms in the community as well, too. And, and, and also, as I said, with the companies, too, because, you know, um, we know which companies supply what types of food, um, the rice, uh, the flour millers, uh, the meat sectors as well too. And, uh, and then we can, uh, we can suggest, you know, where and where, uh, where they should go to. Okay, thank you. Now, now the question is with Maha because the, the, this question is was heard like uh, many times. Uh, Maha, uh, the question is for you that uh, we all know that uh, during this pandemic, everyone was talking about that vitamin C and D and its, it's importance uh, with your immunity. So can you devise some sort of strategical uh, combination of food that can give at least, at least uh, the proper version of vitamin C and D for, for the children and the mother who are, who are diversely affected with all these pandemic situations? Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, Ms. Sadia, you asked me the combinations of foods which are composed of the vitamin C and vitamin D, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, because there are lots of literature is available that uh, that is uh, talking about the importance of these two vitamins, particularly uh, for immunity for mother and the children. Uh, actually, um, actually, the main concept uh, which people are in, uh, like they know about the importance of the vitamin C. Why only vitamin C? We are talking about the antioxidants. Right, antioxidants. It is present in the vitamin C. Antioxidants present in vitamin A. Antioxidants present in the vitamin E. So the combination of all the vitamins, especially the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. 
So the combinations which I am going to uh, take first thing, uh, seasonal fruits and the vegetables. Uh, especially here in Pakistan, the winter season is heading towards. So the citrus fruits, they are, uh, we can see uh, very easily in the markets. And the citrus fruits, they are the high source of the vitamin C. So uh, going towards, uh, if you are talking about the nuts, we are talking about nuts, but first roasted, no uh, unsalted nuts should be consumed. No roasted nuts should be consumed. Why? Because they are high amount uh, in the salt. So unroasted nuts and unsalted nuts, they are, amount, uh, they are high source of the vitamin E. They are high source of the omegas. So it is also the antioxidants, not only the vitamin C, but uh, also the vitamin, uh, as I mentioned earlier, all the fat soluble vitamins and the water soluble vitamins, they are the antioxidants and the instructions uh, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that cereals right? Cereals, they have the nutraceuticals, they have active components that uh, protects your body against the multiple diseases. Uh, basically, the presence of the antioxidant in a particular food, it is responsible to protect your body against the multiple diseases. Not only the vitamin C, I'm repeating again. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Because there was a very, very uh, big conception that, okay, vitamin C and D and lots of people are taking the multivitamins. And that was even, uh, they were saying that this is the, and the, if you're not taking the food properly, you can take the multivitamins and they are taking it. Uh, to yeah, Ms. Sadia, uh, Ms. Sadia, as I talked earlier, that only not one food and not only one supplement is enough to boost your immune system. It is a pack of the nutrients. It should be the pack of the nutrients. It should be a balanced diet which covers all the nutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients in terms of carbohydrate, protein, fats, vitamins and minerals. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Dr. Altaf, can you hear me? Because there is a suggestion and that, that is a very particularly good suggestion uh, for, for this. So um, the suggestion is that uh, can we have um, another, uh, you know, perception, maybe another talk about, about the strategies, because uh, these are the, the series of webinars and we are talking about the different aspects of it. This was the very first step, very first initial step for today's talk. So why not to, to strategize the things that how we can, uh, how we can recommend or give the strategies or to the supply chain of the food uh, because uh, there are lots of people or the vulnerable classes, vulnerable groups within the communities in all the lower middle income countries. So can we have another uh, uh, strategic talk on uh, the supply chain problems uh, which can indicate it by all the um, lower and middle income countries? Uh, sorry. Yes, Adia, I think it's a very good point and that's, that's what where this collaboration we want to extend and we need to identify some of more important areas. This is just like one of the, you need to start from somewhere. So this, we do understand that uh, infants and children and uh, especially the, the, the women are the most vulnerable group uh, when it comes to the emergencies or this sort of pandemic situations, they will get the least, uh, you know, the nutritious portion or the least access to the food. So this is the first series and we want to start with trying to understand the, the extent of this problem. We do understand this is a problem and it's, uh, it's, it's happening not only in Pakistan or in Philippines or any other uh, similar country, but all over the world. Now, yep, there's multi, the, the problem is as, as, we, as we discussed earlier, the, the, prop, the pandemic has impacted our life, lives in a multiple dimensions, correct? So it's impacted our food supply, it's impacted our health, it's impacted our mental health, and so on. So I, I, I totally agree, and we will identify some of the other potential uh, topics, including the, the, the disruption of this food supply chain and the impact on uh, on the availability of some of the nutritious food, especially what we call them, the healthy diets. So we will plan with uh, UCP and other collaborators in, in near future.
So that's wonderful because uh, we were we were already talking about that how we can continue because this collaboration and this this regional series is based on the the objective that we can highlight some of the problems and we can give the recommendation and strategies and this will be the continued process i hope uh, the university of central punjab is already um, is incorporating everything and at their best and i hope the api fp the members the hierarchy uh, which is present and indicating in all over the world you are present in all over the countries so in our next sessions i would rather suggest have a more interaction with all the other uh, people, uh, not only from the Pakistan, but around the world, so that we can have the best things out of it. And uh, this, this series should be more meaningful. Um, I, in the end, I guess um, uh, there, there is not a stop of the session. This, this is only the one first step we had taken um, at the University of Central Punjab along with the API FP. And hopefully in our next sessions, uh, we will getting more identified uh, areas which have to be highlighted regarding the food security, food and nutrition, and their importance within the pandemic because COVID is not going anywhere and we have to live with it. That is the new normal, which, which we are talking about. So with this new normal, how we can uh, couple up our problems and how we can um, engage the, the community along with this process, uh, University of Central Punjab and APAFP has all uh, get together and we are hoping for the best sessions ahead. Um, at the end, I am highly highly thankful to Dr. William for his valuable talk and his time which he's dedicated to giving us uh, giving to us uh, beside the, all the technicalities and all the issues but um, once again I'm highly highly obliged to Dr. William. Thank you, Dr. William, and uh, uh, Dr. Malik Altaf, who is, uh, who is uh, the man behind all the things and who is organizing uh, the proper uh, things and who is having the, all the vision to do the things in a proper way. And hopefully we are getting uh, in touch in, in the law. Thank you, Ms. Maha, uh, the participant from the from the Punjab Food Authority. That was a valuable things which you have mentioned with us. And at the end, I'm highly thankful to all the student affairs department, marketing department, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Raza Garaya and uh, Ahmed Bilal for all the facilitation they have provided to us for the successful run of this talk. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for watching us. And hopefully, we are having another session and a very interactive session uh, in the future too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you so much.